the white snake. A long time ago, there lived a king who was famed for his wisdom through all the land. Nothing was hidden from him, and it seemed as if news of the most secret things was brought to him through the air. But he had a strange custom. Every day after dinner, when the table was cleared and no one else was present, a trusty servant had to bring him one more dish. It was covered, and even the servant did not know what was in it. Neither did anyone know, for the king never took off the cover to eat of it until he was quite alone. This had gone on for a long time. When one day the servant who took away the dish was overcome with such curiosity that he could not help carrying the dish into his room, when he had carefully locked the door, he lifted up the cover and saw a white snake laying on the dish. But when he saw it, he could not deny himself the pleasure of tasting it, so he cut off a little bit and put it into his mouth. No sooner had it touched his tongue than he heard a strange whispering of little voices outside his window. He went and listened, and then noticed that it was the sparrows who were chattering together and telling one another of all kinds of things which they had seen in the fields and woods. Eating the snake had given him power to understand the language of animals. Now it so happened that on this very day the queen lost her most beautiful ring, and suspicion of having stolen it fell upon this trusty servant, who was allowed to go everywhere. The king ordered the man to be brought before him, and threatened with angry words that unless he could, before the morrow, point out the thief, he himself should be looked upon as guilty and should be executed. In vain he declared his innocence; he was dismissed with no better answer. In his trouble and fear, he went down into the courtyard and took thought how to help himself out of his trouble. Now some ducks were sitting together quietly by a brook and taking their rest, and whilst they were making their feathers smooth with their bills, they were having a confidential conversation. The servants stood by and listened. They were telling one another of all the places where they had been waddling about all the morning, and what good food they had found. And one said in a pitiful tone, "Something lies heavy on my stomach. As I was eating in haste, I swallowed a ring which lay under the queen's window." The servant at once seized her by the neck, carried her to the kitchen, and said to the cook. Here is a fine duck. Pray kill her. Yes, said the cook, and weighed her in his hand. She has spared no trouble to fatten herself, and has been waiting long enough to be roasted. So he cut off her head, and as she was being dressed for the spit, the queen's ring was found inside her. The servant could now easily prove his innocence. The king, to make amends for the wrong, allowed him to ask for a favor and promise him the best place in the court. The servant refused everything and asked only for a horse and some money for traveling, as he had a mind to see the world and go about a little. When his request was granted, he set out on his way. One day he came to a pond where he saw three fishes caught in the reeds. And gasping for water, now though it is said that fishes are dumb, he heard them lamenting that they must perish so miserably. As he had a kind heart, he got off his horse and put the three prisoners back into the water. They quivered with delight, put out their heads, and cried to him, "We will remember you and repay you for saving us." He rode on. And after a while, it seemed to him that he heard a voice in the sand at his feet. He listened and heard an ant king complain, "Why cannot folk with their clumsy beasts keep off our bodies? That stupid horse with his heavy hoofs has been treading down my people without mercy." So he turned on to a side path, 
the ant king cried out to him, "We will remember you. One good turn deserves another." The path led him into a wood, and there he saw two old ravens standing by the nest and throwing out their young ones. Out with you, you idle, good-for-nothing creatures! Cried they, "We cannot find food for you any longer. You are big enough and can provide for yourselves." But the poor young ravens lay upon the ground, flapping their wings and crying, "Oh, what helpless chicks we are!" We must shift for ourselves, and yet we cannot fly. What can we do but lie here and starve? So the good young fellow alighted and killed his horse with his sword and gave it to them for food. Then they came hopping up to it, satisfied their hunger, and cried, "We will remember you. One good turn deserves another." And now he had to use his own legs. And when he had walked a long way, he came to a large city. There was a great noise and crowd in the streets, and a man rode up on horseback, crying aloud, "The king's daughter wants a husband, but whoever sues for her hand must perform a hard task. If he does not succeed, he will forfeit his life." Many had already made the attempt, but in vain. Nevertheless. When the youth saw the king's daughter, he was so overcome by her great beauty that he forgot all the danger, went before the king and declared himself a suitor. So he was led out to the sea, and a gold ring was cast into it. Then the king ordered him to fetch this ring up from the bottom of the sea and add it. If you come up without it, you will be thrown in again and again until you perish. Amid the waves, all the people grieved for the handsome youth. Then they went away, leaving him alone by the sea. He stood on the shore and considered what he should do. When suddenly he saw three fishes come swimming towards him. They were the very fishes whose lives he had saved. The one in the middle held a mussel in his mouth, which it laid on the shore at the youth's feet. When he had taken it up and opened it. There lay the gold ring in the shell. Full of joy, he took it to the king, and expected that he would grant him the promised reward. But when the proud princess perceived that he was not her equal in birth, he scorned him and required him first to perform another task. She went down into the garden and strewed with her own hands ten sackful of. Millet seeds on the grass. Then she said, "Tomorrow morning before sunrise, these must be picked up, and not a single grain be wanting." The youth sat down in the garden and considered how he might perform this task, but he could think of nothing. And there he sat sorrowfully awaiting the break of day, when he should be led to death. But as soon as the first ray of sun shone into the garden, he saw all the ten sacks standing side by side, quite full, and not a single grain was missing. The ant king had come in the night with thousands and thousands of ants, and the grateful creatures had, by great industry, picked up all the millet seeds and gathered them into the sacks. Presently. The king's daughter herself came down into the garden and was amazed to see that the young man had done the task she had given him, but she could not yet conquer her proud heart and said, "Although he has performed both the task, he shall not be my husband until he has brought me an apple from the tree of life." The youth did not know where the tree of life stood. But he set out and would have gone on for ever, as long as his leg would carry him, though he had no hope of finding it. After he had wandered through the three kingdoms, he came one evening to a wood and lay down under a tree to sleep. But he heard a rustling in the branches, and a golden apple fell into his hand. At the same time, three ravens flew down to him, perched themselves upon his knee, and said. We are the three young ravens whom you saved from starving. When we had grown big and heard that you were seeking the golden apple, 
We flew over the sea to the end of the world where the tree of life stands and have brought you the apple. The youth, full of joy, set out homeward and took the golden apple to the king's beautiful daughter, who had now no more excuses left to make. They cut the apple of life in two and ate it together, and then her heart became full of love for him, and they lived to a great age in undisturbed happiness. The End